Excellent. So we come to, unfortunately, the last two speakers of what's been an amazing two days. So the next speaker is my very good friend, Professor Carl June, who's at the University of Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, I should say, in USA. Use of genetically modified T cells in the treatment of cancer. Can we please give Carl a big welcome? Thanks very much, Carl. Looking thank forward you. to your talk. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you, Chris and uh, Ian and Johan, um, for a, a great learning experience for me um, to, to see this uh, session today. So um, I'm disclosing now that I have a sponsorship by Novartis, and then I'll discuss off-label use of CTL-019. Um, so this was introduced in part um, by our previous speakers, but cancer is now realized to be a disease of genetics with abnormal pathways, but finally there's been another pathway, which is that the, this cancer cell, in order to evolve, has to uh, uh, um, become, invoke tolerance to it so that it's not rejected. And um, so that's why we now have this field of emerging immuno-oncologies, where um, you heard from Bent Jakobson describe checkpoint therapies, um, and uh, adoptive cell transfer, or ACT, as I'll refer to it. Um, and, uh, and, and it began with vaccines, but now really these two have become the dominant modalities. And then the adoptive cell transfers uh, comes in three flavors. There's a, um, the so-called tumor infiltrating lymphocytes, and I'll mention, and then uh, gene transfer methods involving CAR T cells and T cell receptor T cells. Um, and uh, I reviewed this recently with some colleagues. So the, the TIL therapy is more uh, logistically complex. It, it happens in patients uh, who have uh, a surgically accessible metastatic lesion that then is grown in the lab. Um, and this is now open, you know, in a phase three trial in Europe. Uh, Robert Hawkins is leading it here in the, in the UK. Um, and it's had sort of a, it was a first trial to be started, these TIL approach. Um, but it's had, it's been basically the comeback kid in that now with genetic uh, testing of tumors, the neoantigens are created by mutations, can be targeted by TIL. So um, it's one way to achieve the kind of therapy that Bent showed you with natural T cells. Um, so far, it's only worked uh, routinely in melanoma, but there are some striking cases in other kinds of tumors, such as uh, uh, biliary tract cancer that have been reported. The other uh, approaches start with the blood, and so therefore, logistically more uh, uh, simple, and then involve gene transfer to insert CARs or T cell receptors, and, um, and then the cells are then after manufacturing given to patients. So, so we began uh, our leukemia trials in 2010, and if you search on clinicaltrials.gov, as of about two weeks ago, there were 77 trials ongoing now with CAR T cells. Uh, most of them are in the U.S., um, and a lot of the basic science was, for CAR T cells was done here in UK and Europe, and yet they only have eight trials open. And I think that's a regulatory issue, um, not science. Um, and China has gone from having no trials to 20, and I'm sure will outpace the US shortly. So there's geographic disparities of where these trials are, but it's gone from a small handful of people doing these uh, five years ago to now where it's an emerging industry. Um, and I'm going to then. Uh, dwell on what CAR T cells are there um, and, and some of the clinical results. Um, and these are some of the major issues facing the field, which are is a long term persistence of these CARs required. Um, you know, they're um, referred to as a living drug. When you put these genes in, they stay in the patient um, and uh, through various mechanisms. And, and how do we, how long should we have these persist, for instance, is one issue that's open. Another is how genetically to modify the, the T cells, and there's a number of approaches such as lentiviral vectors, retroviral vectors, uh, and, and things like transposases, sleeping beauty, and, and even RNA electroporation, which we have trials underway with. So there's a number of ways to genetically modify T cells. Um, and then what kind of T cell do we want to use? There are a number of subsets of cells, and, and I have focused on memory stem cells. Um, but there are, are other kinds of cells, such as effector cells, and I'll briefly talk about that. And, and this is the same point that uh, Bent Jakobsen raised, which is how can we combine checkpoint therapy with CAR T cell therapy, which um, our preclinical data and others 
show are very uh, synergistic. Um, so cars didn't just start. Um, the first one was reported in 1991 uh, by Art Weiss at the University of California, and it was a synthetic molecule made to actually test the signal transduction properties of the T cell receptor. So he fused the intracellular zeta chain of the T cell receptor with an extracellular domain of CD4. Uh, and this then retargeted cells to HIV because CD4 is the receptor for HIV. And uh, we did the first CAR trial um, starting in 1997 then. So this was then expressed with a retroviral vector. and, and um, we treated about 40 patients with that with HIV and found that it was safe. And we found that the cells have persisted in those initial patients treated beginning in 1997 now for more than a decade in the patients with an average half-life of greater than 17 years. So very long-term engraftment in, in those patients and no safety. Um, and then the field evolved with grafting of antibody or antibody fragments onto the CAR signaling domains and then ever more complex signaling domains to add in co-stimulation, because the first cancer trial done with CARS was reported in, 19, uh, in 2006 from the Netherlands, and um, it was a so-called first-generation CAR that just had the zeta chain, and the cells did not persist in the patient. So it's different than in HIV. Um, likely, the tumor microenvironment is more immunosuppressive in cancer than in non-cancer conditions. So this is the, the CAR that we currently have in clinical trials uh, with a 4MBB co-stimulatory signaling domain, and another that's an advanced trials in the United States are, is uh, the CD28 co-stimulatory domain. Um, and we've been studying those now. Um, and this is work by uh, Amkar Kualakar in my lab where, um, to ask if we can change metabolism of, of CAR T cells. So T cells go through cycles. They can go from a naive resting cell to then an effector cell where they are good at killing targets, and then back to a memory cell that can persist for the rest of your life. If you then get reinfected, these cells can revert back to this stage. And they, they eat different food. At this point, they're, they're basically sugar burners. They're all glycolysis. Um, and uh, to make their energy, they're very energetically demanding when T cells are very motile. Um, and at the memory stage, they are, live off mitochondrial and fatty acid oxidation and Krebs cycle. Um, and we've been measuring this in CAR T cells with uh, the so-called seahorse assay, looking at oxygen consumption rates, uh, where we can, uh, uh, by various mitochondrial inhibitors, measure oxygen consumption. Um, and what we have found is that if you have a CAR that expresses C28 signaling domain, it, it is an effector cell that lives off oxygen, uh, glucose, and uh, makes a lot of pyruvate, and lactic acid turns the media orange very rapidly. And if you look by confocal microscopy, they have virtually no uh, mitochondria. And if you have a cell that has the same retargeted CAR, but now has a 4MBB signaling domain, it's full of mitochondria. And so it has turned on mitochondrial biogenesis, um, and you can actually count these. So you can visually tell what signaling domains the CAR has by, uh, by this simple assay of counting the mitochondria. So, so this is a new property of CAR T cells, and, and that is that you can reprogram their metabolism as well as their specificity. Um, and we think this can help have, a, have cells that are destined to have short persistence in patients or long persistence. And this may explain the results of, of, of our clinical trials where we've used this 4MBB signal domain. And, and as I'll show, we've had CARs persist now in cancer patients for more than five years. And we believe that's because they have the metabolic capacities that you see with um, uh, memory cells. So we uh, treated our first patients with the second generation CAR in 2010, and, um, just, and the first three patients had responses, and we just now have published the five-year follow-up of that, and there are 14 patients on the trial. And um, um, the overall response rate, this is an advanced refractory uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia, which is the most common uh, leukemia in the US. And it was, um, we had an overall response rate of 40, 57% with uh, four CRs and four PRs. Um, and um, so now we can look back and see what are the characteristics of the responding to the non-responding patients. And we have uh, measured these CARs in the patients, both in the blood and in bone marrow, with a PCR assay that detects the 4MBB sequence adjacent to, to TCR 
zeta sequence, which is not that way in the natural human genome. So the PCR is specific to the transgene that's integrated in at one to two vector copies per T cell. And this is on a log scale. So um, what, what you could see is that the CR patients, and the, the x-axis is out to a year, have uh, a, a very high spike of CARS 10 to 20 days after the CARS are infused. At this point, in this patient, essentially 100% of the peripheral blood is CAR cells. And then the, what happens is a target goes away, the patient went in remission, and also his normal B cells, as I'll talk about, and then, then what happens is they refer to having memory levels, and in this patient uh, now five years later. Um, and that, that happened to all the patients who you can see are arrayed with the CRs on top. But the non-responding patients have CARs in a graft, but the frequency is about a thousand-fold less than it is in the um, uh, re responding patients. So we think it's a numbers game if you don't have enough effector cells. Um, the, our patients that we initially treated all had between five and seven pounds of tumor. And so a single infusion was able to eradicate that, but it required substantial proliferation. Um, and now we can look if there is durable anti-leukemic effects, and this is using next-generation sequencing for the, the gene that gets mutated in uh, uh, CLL is the IGH, the receptor, B cell receptor. And initially, these patients in peripheral blood and bone marrow were nearly all um, one rearranged receptor, so 99.76, for instance, in patient one. So you had a packed bone marrow. And then we can, we've looked out here, in his case, to three and a half years in, in the bone marrow. And with very deep sequencing, we've looked at a million cell equivalents. We can't find that receptor anymore. So. Um, we think that the patients have had the leukemic clone eradicated. The same, it was the same in all four patients. Um, it's still possible they could have late relapses, as Bent Jakobsen pointed out. It would likely be an immune sanctuary site. That's what happens in bone marrow transplant. Usually the leukemia is eradicated where it starts, which is in, and, uh, in the bone marrow. But if they do have relapses, it's usually in a sanctuary site. Uh, so where we've measured it, the, the clone has been eradicated by a sensitive technology. And so do these cells remain functional? You know, they, these, their CAR cells can be um, a living drug. This shows um, our patient two who at a year, uh, a thousand days later, we can detect the CAR on the surface because it's an antibody and we can stain it with an anti-idiotype. And this patient had a mixture of CD8 and CD4 CARs. Um, um, mostly CD8 here, and they remain functional. He donated blood between days 50 to 1,000 days after treatment. And when we put them on leukemia targets, they either have CD19, so take his peripheral blood, and directly incubate with either CD19 positive targets, which is what the leukemia uh, expresses, or, or cells that don't have AML targets that don't have um, CD19. We get specific degranulation, as you can see. And, so, so the cells uh, remain functional, at least a subset. Um, and as of July this year, we had treated now uh, 180 patients with various B cell malignancies, uh, initially CLL, and then we began with ALL in 2012. So our follow-up's longest in CLL. Um, and both pediatric and adult, we, we have had a higher response rate than that 57% rate that I showed for uh, CLL. So that's a major surprise. We now have enough power in to say that the response rate is higher in a disease with a much more rapid cell proliferation kinetics, ALL compared to CLL, very different tumors, and yet we have a 90% CR rate in ALL. Um, and, and, and that's what we published. The, the survival of relapse refractory ALL otherwise is about uh, 10 to 20% at two years. So we have um, very promising results so far. Our first patient treated was uh, Emily Whitehead, who was a six-year-old. She's now 10, um, and here, shown here, she was invited to the White House in January of 2015 because uh, um, uh, of all the attention that came, but that's when President Obama and um, uh, uh, Francis Collins, the NIH director, announced the Precision Medicine Initiative, and he invited her to the White House to be in the front row on that. Um, and this is the case of Emily. So she happened to be the first patient on our trial. We had pediatric ALL and adult ALL trials. And um, she got no chemotherapy. She had had a, uh, an Icarus deleted chemotherapy, a genotype that's not responsive to chemotherapy. And all the chemotherapy she'd had had left her lymphopenic, but with a packed bone marrow for tumor, which you can see um, 
here there's, these are sequential bone marrow specimens and blood. She had all of her uh, leukemic, all of her IGH were of one dominant clonotype, and then that you can see the clearance of those after it took six months until they were um, not detectable any longer. So she's now more than three years out with um, no further treatment except B cell replacement therapy. So all of our patients are getting gamma globulin replacement therapy if they have persistent B cell aplasia. Um, so we can now uh, compare CARS. Uh, there are three in advanced development in the US. Uh, this is the one being developed by Novartis that came from my lab. This is the one developed at the National Cancer Institute. Uh, no, the, uh, yes, and then this is the one being developed at um, Memorial Sloan Kettering and, and being tested uh, um, uh, now by uh, Juno. And um, uh, so they reviewed these. They have different single chain FVs, they have different affinities. It's hard to compare results because no single, no, the variables haven't been held constant between cell manufacturing. The car signaling domains, our, ours, as I mentioned, has 41BB. These others have CD28. So they're both second generation cars, but different designs, different affinities. And they're introduced into the T cells with, in these two cases, retroviruses, and ours with a, an HIV based lentivirus. And um, the expression has been very different in the published trials. So it was short duration, about a month, with, with uh, those two. And, um, now more than actually five years on our first patient that we've treated. And then, um, but the response rate in AL, ALL has been the same, about a 90% CR rate. ALL rapidly goes into remission with these cars. And, but in, in CLL, it's quite different. As I showed, we've had a 57% response rate, and there were no responders uh, with this car. So it, it appears that you need durable persistence in CLL, and it takes longer to get complete remissions as I'll show then in ALL, which in some cases can be in a complete remission within two weeks. Okay, so we have had some resistance, um, and they're different in the different diseases. In, in ALL, as I mentioned, in adults, we've had about a 90% CR rate, um, but we've had 15 patients who relapsed, um, and 10 of those relapsed with loss of B cell aplasia. And, and so we think um, their B cells came back, so we're now uh, treating uh, with repeat infusions if they uh, lose, lose engraftment. Um, and then we've had um, 10 cases, I'm sorry, we had five, five relapses that were, um, uh, five relapses that were early B cell A pleasure loss, and then 10 with loss of CD19, so their target loss. And for that, we're, we're developing other cars on B cell lineages so that they'll get a combination. Um, we haven't had target loss in CLL, so in ALL they can lose CD19, but in CLL it's rare. So I mentioned we had four cases with CRs with the CLL cases in, in this array, but one of them was looked to be an outlier, and that was patient 10. And we now have an interesting lesson from him. So if we plot the PK, which is the car and blood again, as I showed, this is what it looks like in, in, in our CLL cases, um, this patient, you can see, had a much later emergence of his CLL cells. Now, so when you get to 1,000 copies per microgram genomic DNA, that's essentially all of your peripheral blood is a car. So this is when they have cytokine release syndrome and tumor lysis syndrome, and then they decay down to the memory levels that I said by going down several orders of magnitude. Um, and so that patient was an outlier that way. And this is what happened. The patient is now 81 years old, but he had massive CLL with a, a 15 centimeter mass around his uh, aorta uh, and packed. He had bone marrow leukemia and, and circulating cells. Um, but he, at day 28, when we first assessed for response, he was a non-responder. He still had a packed bone marrow. But on day 45, he presented to our hospital, developed fevers, and then had fulminant cytokine release syndrome and tumor lysis syndrome. 50 days after we had treated him. He required uh, hospitalization, intubation, and then we treated with tocilizumab, which blocks IL-6 signaling, and, um, and, and that reversed that, and, and he's now in complete remission. You can see at two months after treatment, he still had persistent lymphoma mass, and, um, and but a year, which I'm not showing here, he's, he remains in, he's in remission for three years now. Uh, so how did that happen? Um, Turns out we sorted his cells on day 28. So we sorted the CAR positive cells, and on day 28, 
there are all 23 B beta T cell receptor families. So, so we, we sorted the CAR positive cells. They were CD8 cells and, and a variety of different um, T cell receptors, all of them recept, um, presented. But on day 51, at the time when the tumor was being eradicated, he only had one T cell receptor, and that was V beta 5.1 present. Um, so a, a clonality here. And um, I won't show all the data, but it turns out his CAR inserted in chromosome 3 and into the gene called TET2. And I put this in here for Irv Weissman, who has studied this. So TET2 is a, um, uh, you know, a demethylated cytosine, cytosine um, methyl cytosine. And um, uh, he had an inactivate. His insertion of the CAR is right between exons uh, 8 and 9 of TET2, and it functionally inactivates one allele of TET2 in this patient. Um, and and, and uh, the stem cell field has shown that TET2 increases renewal of stem cells, um, although it's not oncogenic by itself. And um, so our patient uh, may have had, what we don't know yet is whether this was a passenger or a driver or not. So one cell cured that patient. I think we can say that definitively from the data that I showed you. Um, and, so, but, and massive proliferation. So he went from one cell that wasn't even detectable on day 28, or in his infusion product, it was a very rare cell, and it had to have had um, more than uh, 20 to probably 30 population doublings, because at the time of tumor lysis, he had approximately 10 to the 11th CAR cells in him. So the principle is to, to redirect cells and then make them have a proliferative capacity in the patient and not have to grow them all in a lab. You don't need a lot of cells, you need one good one, um, I think is the message. So, so that's a, an outlier. That was one out of 180 patients, but it taught us an important lesson, and we're gonna look at intentionally disrupting TET2 now um, and testing that. I'm not saying that's gonna be something that goes right in the clinic, but that's, it's a concept. So we, we've also now looked at the treatment in uh, myeloma with uh, these CD19 cars, um, and um, this myeloma you know, starts by mutations, often translocations, in, in a B cell that's C19 positive. It goes through a state of so-called MGUS myeloma, a gammopathy of unknown <coughs> significance, and then evolves into the disease that's uh, unfortunately usually incurable, progressive bone erosion, with, that's CD19 negative. Um, and, and when you talk to a hematopathologist, although we thought maybe it might be CD19 dim, dimly positive, because the CARs are very, and T cell receptor engineered cells, are en enormously, they can see very low levels of target, as Bent uh, pointed out. And so we thought maybe there could be also, you know, like a epithelial mesenchymal transition, and the cells, and there's some data that may go back and forth between a CD19 positive state and a 19 negative state. And, and people have reported finding the clonal B cells that have the same rearranged receptor in blood, as, as you can see uh, in the marrow, in the malignant plasma cells that are 19 negative. So perhaps we could target a precursor cell or dim level expression, um, and that's why we started a, a trial. Um, and the, the, so it's a pilot study looking at patients in the US who have advancing myeloma receive an autologous stem cell transplant. Um, and then we required that they had to have progression, and then we gave them a second transplant uh, with the same malfalan conditioning and then an infusion of the car. And the idea is to look, measure them the time of progression too, to see if there's a remission inversion. Um, and so it's a pilot study of 10 patients of which we've just enrolled the number 10 patient. Um, and we're asking, do we have the same endpoints of, of safety and feasibility such as cytokine release syndrome um, um, and uh, uh, engraftment of the car cells, B cell aplasia, and a remission inversion. And uh, so we just reported the first two patients on this trial. Both of them have had uh, very prominent anti-tumor responses. Um, but the first one had very severe cytokine release syndrome um, and um, had gotten 360 million cars. Um, so we then uh, modified protocol and then have now been treating with 50 million. And um, the second patient had no side effects except hypogamma globulinemia. Um, so, um, but the first patient had very severe uh, cytokine release syndrome, and, and myeloma cells can make themselves IL-6, and IL-6 is what we think is mostly involved in the, the cytokine release syndrome. 
Um, and uh, this is what happened to our second patient. She had an IgA myeloma, as shown here at our first transplant, uh, uh, two grams of, um, of the, uh, of the um, plasma cytoma of the pair protein were here in the blood, and she didn't respond to 200 milligrams of malflan, then got lenalidomide and a variety of other bortezomib drugs added back in. Um, and um, so, and uh, then she came on to the second trial with uh, a myeloma of face in her bone marrow. This is CD138 staining and bone marrow failure with, with a kind of uh, thrombocytopenia. And then um, she had nine lines of prior therapy and had genetically the worst kinds of every bad marker, biomarker you can have for myeloma. And this is what happened. The second transplant, um, she'd now gone to five to six grams of her paraprotein, which is a marker of tumor mass in myeloma and secreted by the, the um, myeloma cells. And she got a dose-reduced melphalan autologous stem cell transplant. So that's because she had stem cell damage, organ damage from the first transplant. And then, so the real difference here is that she got CAR cells infused, and she's now been in a molecular remission for more than a year. Um, and, and her platelet counts, and, and she now has a normal blood count. So a very striking response where all previously administered forms of chemotherapy failed. Um, and um, I, I'm not showing the data. It was published in the New England Journal that we, by as, looking as hard as we can, we can't find any CD19 in her baseline myeloma cells. Um, so 99.97% of her myeloma cells were C19 negative and had no transcripts for C19. She had 0.05% of her cells had detectable transcripts. So we had to have an indirect effect here. Um, and, and we don't know yet the mechanism. One could be this paper by Shalapur. This is from Mike Karen's lab that was in Nature recently, where he showed in prostate cancer models that if you target non-malignant B cells in the tumor microenvironment, it enhances the response to chemotherapy. Um, and um, so it's possible that with melphalan, we got more mileage out of it by targeting normal B cells. Um, and um, another, it's also possible that there are subsets or that this transitioning back and forth to a C19 positive state. There's a recent paper showing that in humans, there are really four major subsets of plasma cells, and two of them do express CD19. So, um, so it, it may be possible to treat some C19 negative malignancies with C19 uh, cars. Um, so this is a slide from Chris Mason. And um, we, we uh, are in this point where we're, I think, you know, where this whole meeting really is, you know, going from the three models of our current healthcare of um, pharmaceutical industry and devices and biotech to, you know, uh, to making a fourth pillar, which will include cell therapies. Um, I don't know how long right now our main issue and that of Novartis is a so-called N of one. And I'm sure that you have all discussed that. Uh, it, it, it's worth the effort if it works, is what I would say. And right now, N of one is the only way we've been able to get long-term engraftment of cells, unless you do a full myeloblative transplant. So, but I do think that at some point we will have third-party cells where um, you know, by engineering cells will be able to have off-the-shelf cells. Um, in the US, the, the mod model for genetically engineered cells is that it's going to be done in uh, central manufacturing plants with full pharma control. Um, I think till therapies will happen maybe more peripherally in, in sort of a Red Cross-like model um, at the source, a more point of source where the patients are. Um, and um, so I've, I've in summary, you know, what I've tried to show is that multiple factors affect the efficacy of these engineered cell therapies, of which one is the synthetic biology aspects of how you modify the cell, either with CARs, TCRs, et cetera. The sky is the limit now, especially now with uh, CRISPR technologies and so on that will allow us to target many different aspects of cells to change their traffic, for instance, what lymphocyte subset to use, and, and then how to actually manufacture the cells. All those are important to the, to the final outcome. Um, so I've shown that durable remissions occur in CLL. Uh, we've had durable remissions in ALL for three years now, um, and in promising uh, results in, in myeloma via an unexplained uh, mechanism at this point. And, and now our, uh, 
or in the one experiment showing that at least in some cases a single cell is enough to eradicate a very large burden tumor. A lot of people are involved in these studies. Um, just like to ho highlight Bruce Levine, who, who's worked with me since 1992 to uh, make uh, the cell manufacturing uh, t technology. David Porter, who's taking care of all our leukemia patients. And um, Michael Malone made the, CD, the 4MBB core in my lab, and uh, Stephen Grupp and his team at Children's Hospital who have taken care of all the pediatric uh, leukemia patients. And uh, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thanks, Carl. Thank you.